thanks for uh, for showing up, everyone. I'm really excited about presenting, um, and, and also excited about one day doing this in person again. Um, I will I will for sure explain this cartoon um, for those of you who are watching and enjoying it now. Um, but I want to start with um, something else, um, and this is my conflict of interest. Now, those of you who have seen me present before, you know that I am not lucky enough to ever have a conflict of interest. And so um, rather than just have a boring slide that says so, I like to use um, funny cat pictures, right? So about a year ago, right, right as the pandemic um, kind of took hold, um, I was going to present a whip um, on, uh, uh, on a similar topic as today. And um, my son, who was 11 years old at the time, he's now 12, um, like was watching me create my PowerPoint and he saw me put in a funny cat picture. He's like, dad, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? And I explained to him, you know, better have a funny cat picture than nothing. And he said, you know, dad, what you should do is you should have um, a, a lion on the left and a lion on the right. And then you should put your text in the middle. And I'm like, okay, uh, why do you want me to do that? And he said, dad, they, they have to look at the text in the middle, right? And he's like, yeah, I, I, they do. And he said, you can make them read between the lines. And <laughs> oh, thanks Milaz, for unmuting just because I, I need to hear the feedback. That was funny. He appreciates your laughter. Thank you all. Uh, he's been waiting one year for that joke. So that's that this one's for him. Um, so Nicole pointed out that I do have an exciting new uh, job that I'm starting um, July 1st. Uh, it is uh, a, really a terrific opportunity um, in a department with a very exciting name, <laughs> health and wellness design, right? That's, it's a one of a kind. There are a number of people who are on this call who contributed to creating that vision, um, near being one of them. Um, and then there are a number of people from the School of Public Health Bloomington on the call as well. I'm very excited about my future colleagues being there, but uh, my current colleagues, all of you uh, are at Regan Street and elsewhere um, will not be strangers because um, I will, as Nicole said, continue um, at Regan Street and building the bridge between um, Bloomington and Indianapolis. Um, now, Nicole also did a nice preview. It's almost as if we rehearsed this um, about our, our walking. Um, so this is a picture of some members of our team. So uh, at the IU Center for Aging Research, um, we have a team called the Brain Safety Lab. Some of you have heard about the original Brain Safety Lab. This is BSL 2.0, um, you know, began obviously with, with the ARC P30 um, led by Chris Callahan and now co-directed by myself and Noel Campbell, who's a, a clinical pharmacist and a researcher. And, um, and this is the way we designed the lab to have uh, an engineer and a clinician, um, also both you know, skilled in science, um, working together um, for better health. Um, our team is, is a very uh, a unique team. We sometimes go walking during our meetings um, during the pandemic. Um, and uh, apparently some of us walk faster than others. Um, <laughs> I think I, it's okay. But um, I, I told you, I promised you that I would explain what the cartoon was. Um, so Cow Tools, uh, for those of you who don't know, is a, is a far side cartoon um, that was created by Gary Larson. Um, one year after I was born, I looked up when he actually uh, created this one and, and I was surprised to hear uh, it was that old, meaning that I'm that old. Um, and uh, there, there's, I have a fun Wikipedia entry from, the, uh, from about this cartoon, uh, which goes immediately upon the cartoon's publication, um, the company that syndicated the far side was inundated with queries from readers and newspaper editors seeking an explanation of the cartoon. Um, they say the phone never stopped ringing for two days. Larson himself received hundreds of letters about cow tools, some of which he reprinted later. And he had to issue an apology, which is, he's never done that before. He had to issue an apology for confusing his readers by uh, uh, showing them this uh, cartoon. And so this, this actually now lives in kind of the, the lore of cartoons as well as on Wikipedia as a, uh, a completely inscrutable uh, comic that, that people couldn't figure out what it means. Um, and the reason I put it up is because um, I'm going to present to you today on human factors, which is an almost equally inscrutable concept um, that a lot of people don't quite understand. Um, and, and I'm sure uh, if people did understand it, 
and, and wanted to use it, that um, I would be much happier, but people, patients, healthcare professionals would be way better off as well. Um, so I, I, one of my things in life, one of my missions in life is to explain human factors in a way that is simple and makes it worth um, investing in, um, but also just informing people that, that what human factors is um, at its core is what's important, not the discipline or the name itself. Um, I will talk about that in a moment, but uh, whatever you do to design things, the world, to fit humans um, is, is what's really worthwhile. Um, and human factors is a discipline that is devoted to that. The cartoon here, by the way, says, darn these hooves, I hit the wrong switch again, who designs these instrument panels, raccoons. And again, the whole theme is designing to fit the humans to enhance their performance. Um, okay, obviously uh, to advance this. Um, one of the things that is also true though, um, is apart from having a discipline devoted to fitting things to the human is we have a lot of designers who like to fit humans to the things. Um, it's what I call hole in the wall designs. If you've ever seen this TV show that came over from Japan and obviously ended up on Fox in the US. Um, hole in the wall was a TV show in which these contestants had to fit themselves in, in order, they had to contort to fit the, um, the cutouts in that uh, wall that was approaching them. And if they didn't contort themselves, they would get smacked and shoved into a pool. Um, and, and to me, this is a, really a great symbol for, um, for a lot of design. Um, uh, this idea that the human, the user, the, the person has to fit themselves to the design. Um, and as it turns out, people are actually quite flexible. They will do that contorting. They will put themselves in a, in a position to fit bad design, um, but often this is at the expense of performance. Um, this photo I took uh, in a suburb of Philadelphia um, some years ago in a Starbucks. So you probably have no idea what this gentleman is doing, and he is making a phone call. Um, imagine that, that that big thing in front of him is not a laptop and it's a clamshell phone that he unfolded and is talking into. Um, but in, in fact, he's doing it through a laptop because he's on Skype. Um, uh, and, and what he's doing is he is trying to hear better what's happening um, you know, on the other side of the call. Um, and he's trying to like talk into it. So he's using his giant laptop as a, as a, like a, a phone. Um, because he's on Skype. And, um, you know, obviously people will contort, but, ob but also obviously when they contort, sometimes their performance suffers. Um, and sometimes safety suffers as well. We've probably seen pictures like this before. Um, I took this one in, in Los Angeles in a hotel. Um, and I, uh, I just love the fact that, that this is not surprising, that, that people will do things um, when, the design around them is poor, um, but of course there's a cost. Um, so a, a little bit more formally, um, this, this is for the YouTube archives so that, um, that we have a nice formal definition of human factors. Um, I, I say that it is the following. It is designing for people, which is the name of a really wonderful introductory book to human factors, if those of you who want to put that up. Um, and, uh, but not just any people, not in the laboratory, but rather in socio-technical systems in the, in the real world um, to improve work performance and well-being. Um, and so that's, you know, to improve that phone call, but also keep the, that gentleman on a ladder from falling over. Um, and uh, we do this by applying scientific theory and practical tools towards making things fit. Um, So let's come, come back to human factors, that term, um, again, that's in the title of this talk. Um, we're all familiar with the Shakespeare quote, what's in a name? Um, that which we call a rose by any other name would smell sweet, um, unless I would add, it's called a bloody Cranesville, which is the name of the flower in front of you. And as we think about um, Mother's Day coming up this Sunday, would you uh, bring her a flower called a bloody Cranesville? Um, probably not, or stinking sap weevil or whatever. And, and I think that human factors has a branding issue in that it's got a horrible name um, and that even if it smells quite sweet, people aren't even going to approach it because they don't know um, that it's good for them. 
Um, so just imagine instead of human factors, this is the bloody crane spill uh, engineering method. Um, and so we have a bit of a branding issue. People will either not approach it because they don't, they don't think it sounds all that attractive or because they misunderstand what it means. They think that it refers to human resources. Maybe they think of it as human factors, like oh, those yucky human factors. I wish I could just replace them or get rid of them. And, and so this discipline is all about telling me what the problem factors are that I'm, I'm trying to replace as opposed to designing systems to accommodate humans. Um, and of course, human factors goes by a lot of different names um, or has a lot of different uh, uh, versions or kind of children that it has spawned over the years um, that are a little bit more uh, interesting, exciting, but we get a little bit uh, confused about how are they related. So I'm just going to be the maybe the first or maybe the second person um, presenting to say that um, human factors is the same thing as ergonomics. We can talk about the historical reasons for those two terms being different. Um, it is the same as human-centered design. It is systems engineering, or at least one branch of it. Um, Human-computer interaction is human factors for all intents and purposes. Um, usability engineering, user experience design, all this stuff, even implementation science. I know there are different things, but if somebody came to me and said, hey, are you an implementation scientist and can help us design this product, make sure that it actually gets used and implemented in the real world and has real world effect, um, I would say, absolutely, I'm an implementation scientist. When can I start? So, uh, so we have that problem with our name. Um, and of course, we also have the problem of um, not having a really concrete uh, definition um, for the outside world. Um, so remember the definition I gave you. Now I'm going to focus on some of the components. So this idea of systems-oriented, human-centered approach means that we're not separating systems from humans. So it's not like a human solution or design for humans versus designing systems, which a lot of times we think of like the person approach or the systems approach. Um, they're, they're really not uh, contradictory. In fact, the way we I think about it is that we have a system. Here's a picture of a system. We've got tools, we've got tasks, we've got organizational things. They're all connected. And the, the person is part of that system. They're just in the middle. So this is, again, coming back to that concept of we are designing the whole system to make sure that those interactions between people, you know, these ones here, are a good fit. So the technology fits the person. The technology also has to fit the task. And those three things have to fit together. Uh, the next thing is, I said, this is supposed to be a scientific and a practical discipline. It's supposed to be rooted in science, which it is. Uh, but it also has to be practical and design oriented. And, and of course it is, um, I won't spend a lot of time kind of uh, debating this or going into the background, but um, there have been attempts to try to understand what are the benefits of human factors um, or ergonomics. And uh, a lovely article in Nature that actually tries to argue both sides, um, you know, a, a very uh, more kind of positively focused series of, of work by Hal Hendrick and others uh, talking about how good human factors, good ergonomic design um, actually saves money um, and saves lives and uh, improves performance. Um, and of course, there's, there also happens to be a systematic review um, of the uh, effectiveness of human factors and ergonomics in the healthcare setting. Um, it's a 2015 review. It's outdated. It's, it, I would not stake my life on it or my career on it. Um, it is probably not the best evidence supporting human factors, but, um, but there is positive evidence supporting human factors. Um, the better way of arguing for human factors is to look at some of our success cases, I think, um, and they include things like uh, the pre-flight checklist. Right? Um, you might not know about this one, or you might not attribute it to human factors, which is part of our branding problem. Um, but that, that rear brake light at the top um, was added by human factors engineers, um, I, I believe working for a federal agency. Um, and, and of course it has reduced um, fatalities and, um, uh, and accidents on the road uh, considerably um, just by studying the way that people, you know, where do people's eyes go and where does attention go when they're driving. Um, and, and, and often they're looking at somewhere over here. And so having that uh, uh, light you know, place there is actually a, a big deal um, in terms of traffic safety. So that's another example, a popular example, maybe outdated for some folks here, is the iPod. Um, one of the 
uh, projects that Apple did that used the most human factors and ergonomics design resources. Um, in fact, they kind of, if you kind of read about what they did internally, they handed over the keys to that department and said, develop the most usable product you can. They created the iPod, led to the iPhone, the iPad, all those other things that we love. Um, the ergonomic keyboard, even called the ergonomic keyboard, um, uh, based on a lot of good human factors, ergonomic science, um, created by or uh, popularized by Microsoft. Um, so some of the physical ergonomics, the things that you might have thought of as chairs and keyboards and mice, definitely part of the canon of human factors. Um, you know, that, that, that uh, uh, programming guide that we're all used to, human factors design. Um, uh, there's also, you know, entire changes in uh, industry like petrochemical and nuclear uh, energy industries that have made those industries safer as a result of human factors approaches. Um, but we don't necessarily need to look at the exa case examples to, to know that this is a standard of practice um, in a lot of disciplines and a lot of industries. Um, this is a, the human factors ISO standard. Um, this is the, uh, an ISO IEC standard for medical devices. Um, this is the ANSI AME HE75 standard for medical devices. Um, and uh, here at the bottom, you can see this is from the Cures Act um, update of, uh, of uh, HIT or EHR vendor certification. User centered design processes must be applied to each uh, capability of a technology um, that, that is specified in further places in the, in the act, but like you have to use user-centered design that's part of the requirement in order to be uh, a certified EHR vendor, um, kind of dating back to the High Tech Act and then kind of solidified by the 21st Century Cures Act. And, and so the, the, the point is that um, if you're looking for evidence that this is a standard practice that we should use, um, look no further than ISO ANSI and um, uh, uh, the Code of Federal Regulations. Um, but some of you are not, um, you know, EHR vendors, right? So you're wondering, uh, I'm a scientist, is human factors useful for me? Um, and I think the short answer is yes. I'm going to leave the slide up for like, like 10 seconds. Um, it'll get recorded on YouTube. You can look at it later and read it. Uh, these are um, quotes that I pulled out of summary statements from a number of different grants, um, R01s, R21s, KL1. Um, a, a mentored KO1. These are from NIH and HRQ. And you'll see, you know, across the board, innovation, overall impact, significance, overall impact again, mentor, investigator, and approach. And these are just a subset of the ones that I could have pulled. Um, there's a recognition of the value of human factors and user-centered design. So uh, it's innovative. Um, it is, it is a, you know, appropriate as a part of an approach. Um, it, it can affect the overall fundability of the project as well. Um, and, and this is fun, I, but I added this in. This is for um, a project that uh, is pending um, and that we recently submitted um, where the, the summary statement says, in fact, user-centered design is not novel, right? Um, so maybe it won't even give you innovation points. It's not novel. Um, it's mandated for FDA devices and co-design, which is participatory design of products with your users um, is also not novel. In fact, it's more of an expectation that this is going to be done. So I'm not arguing this. I mean, this is kind of a loopy reviewer in my case, in, in my estimation, but um, it's possible that even in the future, um, NIH reviewers are going to be expecting human factors and user-centered design. Um, so you'll be getting dinged for not doing it um, as opposed to getting bonus points. So I think that's the other way that the uh, you know human factors can be scientific and practical uh, for the rest of us. Um, what I want to focus on for the next um, the second half of this talk is is actually on the latter part of this definition that human factors is not just a discipline with a bunch of people who do good work. Um, it's also a field that has produced methods and tools um, for the rest of us, for all of us to use. Um, and this is where if I were changing the the you know, uh, the, um, the talk title, I would probably put the human factors in parentheses. Remember, I don't like the term. I think it's, it's, a, it's a misleading term and one that people don't know. Um, and I would emphasize and take out of parentheses the tools and methods, 
um, because I think that is something that is extensible and we can all use. Um, so uh, 10 years ago, actually, it was in uh, 2011, I, I remember, maybe it's 2012, but um, I, I was asked um, by uh, my colleagues in the Department of Medicine at Vanderbilt University, um, why should we do human factors? Like what's in it for us? Why is this different from you know, your typical health services research? Um, and I had to find a really quick answer for them. I was, I think, probably presenting at a similar kind of venue as this. Um, and I, I needed a slide to convince them. And I thought if I had to do it in one slide, um, what should I do? I went to the tables of content of um, probably five or six methods books kind of on the shelf of my human factors uh, um, library. And I put all those, you know, I, I copied and pasted all of that or typed it in and I, I put it into a word cloud generator and I came up with this. Um, and the, the point is that there are many methods um, and not only are there many methods, but also there's a huge breadth. So just looking at this while I've been talking, I'm sure you saw like the word usability, but you also saw team and communication. You saw things about workload, you know, you've got uh, something on task and simulation and um, something around behavior, maybe behavior change. Um, you've got risk and, and there's safety somewhere here, I'm sure. Um, and so th that's a huge breadth of uh, tools and a, and a big scope. Um, so big that, that I was asked to um, uh, write a paper for a special issue of this journal, um, Research in Social and Administrative Pharmacy or RSAP. Um, and um, I was thinking, what should I write about? Um, the, and I, we, what I did with some of my colleagues, some of whom might even be here, um, uh, but definitely should be familiar to you all, like Ephraim um, and Alyssa, um, we decided to do an overview of human factors and ergonomics tools and methods. In this case, focused on pharmacy research and clinical practice, um, but I think applicable to any situation that anybody watching this uh, would be interested in. Um, <clears throat> and the way we started that, that uh, paper is by pointing out that human factors and ergonomics offers that broad toolkit of methods um, that we are, uh, as human factors professionals, taught and we practice, uh, but can actually also be learnable by others. Um, and so we would, you know, even claim that there are hundreds, hundreds of methods within each of those, hundreds of variation. Um, but I could boil them down to seven categories uh, that could be um, well suited to to health services research, uh, healthcare delivery, and and um, uh, human health purposes. Um, so before I go and present those, I'll just give you kind of the take home lessons first. Um, <clears throat> so if you remember nothing else, um, number one, there are many human factors tools and methods. Uh, number two, using those tools can improve your outcomes, your research and your practical outcomes. Um, and you know, I, get, I gave you some evidence of that, but uh, some of this you'll also have to take on faith. Um, and then number three, your local friendly human factors professional um, and plural professionals, because there are more than just myself around. And if you need to know who those people are, just put that in the chat and I'll be glad to answer. And um, we can help you uh, find the methods, um, you know, select the ones that are appropriate to your need and then help you use them, partner with you to use them. Um, and so um, I, this, this cartoon um, is another Gary Larson. It's got my email underneath it. Every time you see a cartoon, I will nudge you to think about um, emailing me and just letting me know. I am trying to create a better product. I'm trying to test it for usability. Did it fit the person? I'm trying to come up with a good process. Um, can human factors tools help me? And can you help me select the right ones? Uh, so always willing to, to receive emails. Um, and if nothing else, I can forward it on to one of my multiple um, very helpful and very uh, amazing human factors colleagues here in Indianapolis or uh, around the country. Um, so there were seven uh, general categories and methods that we presented in our um, in that paper that I mentioned. Um, and of course, if you access that paper, I'd be happy to share it with you. Um, you can read more about each one. So this is going to be an overview just to give you the buckets. Um, number one, our work system analysis methods. Um, I'll dive into those a little bit more, but essentially they identify, define, and analyze those things in the system that contribute to 
um, better or worse performance. So they're a way to analyze your system um, to determine the, you know, the, the, the causal factors or the shaping performance shaping factors. Um, task analysis is another big bucket of methods. Um, they help you to deeply understand the tasks that are performed by individuals or teams. Um, and often we use that understanding to then inform what should the intervention look like? What should the technology look like? What should the process redesign look like? Um, but it begins with task analysis. Um, and you can see some pictures here. This, this is an example of a, what's called a hierarchical task analysis. You won't be able to necessarily just use it off the shelf, but it's actually fairly simple once you uh, know the basics. Um, this is a link analysis. Um, also looks like it's complicated and has software behind it, but all it's telling you is basically um, how people move through space uh, over time. And, and it provides you a little bit of an understanding of the physical tasks that are performed. Um, and then workload assessment methods are another big branch of methods. They measure the cognitive, physical, and other demands, including emotional demands, um, time demands on a worker relative to the resources available in the system to perform the work uh, in light of those demands. Um, and we have, you know, obviously all sorts of techniques for uh, measuring workload, assessing workload, physiological techniques, um, as well as self-report techniques. One of my favorite and kind of most widely used and, and um, uh, you know, ostensibly uh, valid approaches is actually a self-report measure that's called the NASA TLX or NASA Task Load Index. And it's as simple as filling out um, this, this very um, intuitive questionnaire. So again, if you are thinking, oh, I'd love to measure workload, does this um, new EHR system in, increase workload or decrease workload? Does it increase cognitive workload but decrease physical workload? If you're looking to answer those kind of questions, um, again, there's, there's a tool for that. Um, maybe that's our slogan, like the, the old um, iPhone commercials. Um, there is a tool for it. There are multiple tools for it. I can help you select the right one and implement it. Um, safety and error analysis methods. Actually, this is something that Human Factors is well known for, um, uh, kind of broadly. This is something that, um, you know, put, I think, Human Factors on the map in healthcare around the turn of the century with the Two Errors Human report. And it was, um, you know, what popularized the Swiss cheese model and a number of other Human Factors things um, in, in kind of popular culture. <clears throat> um, now, the, the really neat thing about safety and error analysis methods from human factors is that they aren't only used to investigate incidents that have occurred. They also support prediction of uh, future risk, um, as well as the reporting of, uh, of events that, you know, events, hazards, um, you know, near misses and so forth. <clears throat> um, they also support the mitigation of um, of safety risks. And I think that's important. So human factors is not just about studying, you know, what were the things that happened that were undesirable, but also uh, putting in place mitigation strategies. Um, the, uh, the, the other big bucket of, of uh, activity that you probably know about is uh, already is user-centered and participatory design methods. Um, they're used to develop solutions that again, fit the tasks, needs, and context of the user. Um, I have two examples here, just in the pictures. The first one is um, something we introduced in a, in a just recent BMJ Innovations article um, with Moaz and a colleague of ours um, called Agile Innovation. And it's basically a, a way to, to create user-centered innovation um, quickly uh, in an agile fashion. Um, it's got eight steps, but the way you step through those steps um, uh, helps you to achieve a user-centered product. Um, and then um, this is a, just one example of uh, work that I did with colleagues um, that is participatory design work with older adults. And you know, what, why I show this picture is you can see that um, this, this task has been created, adapted to your typical older adult who has no background in design, but can help you um, to figure out how to do a layout for um, an interface, in this case, an interface that reports uh, data from their implantable electronic device. So um, again, I won't go into the details, um, but, but uh, you can you know where to contact me. Um, usability evaluation methods are ones that assess the degree to which product or system is usable, which 
is defined by ISO, the International Standard uh, Organization, ISO as um, supporting users to achieve specified goals with effectiveness, efficiency, and satisfaction. So why I put that quote up there um, is that usability is not about user friendliness or just feeling nice or being you know, pretty. Um, it's really about supporting your effectiveness in accomplishing tasks, the efficiency with which you do so. And then finally, this is last, satisfaction. Did it please you or not? Uh, but it's, it's actually much more about effectiveness <clears throat> and efficiency than it is about satisfaction. Um, and a, a lot of times when you're doing usability evaluation for an FDA regulated device, um, just satisfaction is not good enough. Um, you really need to show that you know, the error rate is low, that people can use it within a specified amount of time, that people complete the tasks. And this requires um, a lot of very specialized measurement, um, including such things as um, usability testing that are performance-based. And this is one example of a former Regan Street employee um, leading a usability testing um, session. And uh, above that is, is uh, I think, a simple tool uh, that some of you may know, but I just wanted to throw it out there. It's called um, the Simplified SUS or the System Usability Scale. Um, and I'll show you a little bit about it in a second. But first, I want to say that the seventh and last bucket category of, uh, of human factors tools are a number of things that help you understand the physical work performance of, uh, of, of the work that you're studying. So remember, it's not just cognitive ergonomics, it's also physical ergonomics. Okay, so coming back to the SUS real quick, um, in order to find this very simple to use, freely available, free to use instrument, um, you simply search Simplified SUS on Google Scholar. You can visit this website where you can get it for free. Um, it is a uh, what I call a, a thermometer. It just measures the temperature of usability for your product. It is self-report, so it's limited in that sense, um, but it is 10 items. Um, it is valid. Um, we can get into why I think it's valid. Um, it has been called quick, but not so dirty. Originally, it was created to be quick and dirty. Turns out, um, over uh, hundreds of studies and thousands of users using the SUS um, questionnaire that it is not so dirty. Um, now, I did not create the original SUS. Um, all I did was I simplified it for you know, language and um, structure and consistency. So I'm not responsible for the SUS, um, which is nice, but this, the simplified SUS maintains all of the uh, structure and therefore can be compared to the norms generated from hundreds of studies and thousands of users. Um, it is not sufficient for measuring usability, but it is better than nothing. Um, and it is your nice single factor evaluation of usability that anybody can use. Um, you don't even need to email me about this one, um, but feel free if, if you want to learn more. Now, in the end, um, the best projects are actually applying those tools across this array of three phases, the study phase, the design phase, and the evaluation phase. Um, this is sometimes called the engineering life cycle, the user-centered design or human-centered design life cycle. Um, and, um, and this is just a pretty picture that goes along with it. But if you remember two years ago, when I talked about the fool's gold loaf, um, Joy Lee's concept that I put into um, context for uh, work that we've done, you might remember where I talked about how to go through each of those phases for a particular um, a problem, which in this case was trying to improve the safe use of medications by older adults. Um, and really focused on anticholinergic medications, which could potentially harm the brain, um, where we did you know, study phase to try to understand the situation, a design phase to create <clears throat> interventions that would fit the human, and then uh, actually multiple evaluation phases and multiple redesign phases to then um, uh, test whether those solutions truly were usable, effective, and satisfactory. Um, so again, you can read about that case study in, in this new paper. You can also read about each of those uh, uh, segments of research elsewhere. Um, I, I, now, if, if, if you, I'm going to take a pause, I'm going to take a breath, but also remind you that um, if you Google Rich Holden or you ask somebody from um, the world of healthcare and the world of human factors, what is Rich Holden known for, um, you might hear the term SEEPS. 
Um, so SEEPS is a work system model for healthcare. I did not invent it. Um, I, my name is associated with it because I work with this wonderful uh, uh, woman and scientist and colleague, Pascal Carrion. I, I put up a picture of, of her presenting um, from last Friday because she announced her retirement and this was her last uh, big colloquium talk at the University of Wisconsin. <clears throat> so I, get, I got a screen grab of it and it's really a, a touching moment to see her present. She walked through the story, the history of the SEEPS model uh, all the way from 1989 to uh, the SEEPS 2.0 model um, that I uh, led the development of in 2013 and then actually beyond. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so, so this is, uh, I think, you know, a very important tool in the toolkit of human factors. Um, uh, what I want to show you now uh, is a little bit of a, of a, of a preview of something that I, I won't be able to go into full depth, but, um, but this is more of a stay tuned uh, coming attraction. So as you, as you may know, SEEPS, the original, um, was originally published in 2006 in the journal that's now known as DMJ Quality and Safety. Um, in 2013, we published SEEPS 2.0. And then, and then in uh, 2020, uh, Pascal and, and colleagues um, published SEEPS 3.0. Um, and so you can see an incremental improvement you know, over the years from one to two to 3.0, it takes about um, you know, six or seven years between each. Um, I'm, I'm pleased to say that we, in 2021, created something even better called SEEPS 101. Um, and, and so we, this is a bit of a joke. But we, we kind of went um, uh, very high uh, over the, the, the 1.0, 2.0, 3.0 trend. Um, but we created 101 actually um, as, as something of a, of a acknowledgement that um, a lot of the work that we've done in the past has not been easy to use. Um, it has not been you know, uh, meant for practitioners. And it definitely has not been developed for people who don't know what human factors is or don't care what human factors is. And so um, it was relatively limited in its implementation and uh, distribution. Um, so this is the part of the talk where I would change again the title by emphasizing the, the part that's for all. Remember, here's the cartoon, here's my email. Um, and, and, and then this critique um, is a critique that we uh, published actually quite recently about our own work, saying that there is a need, uh, a gap, a non-existent, uh, easy to use version of the SEEPS model and simplified tools to apply the model in practice. And so um, this paper, I'm hoping within a few days or weeks, I'll be able to share it with you. Um, it, it's still kind of towards the end of peer review, um, but it is what we call the SEEPS 101 and seven simple SEEPS tools paper. Um, where we uh, offer SEEPS 101 as a simplified practice-oriented model. Um, and we also, for the first time, present the seven simple SEEPS tools um, that virtually anyone can use off the shelf. Um, the model is very simple. I'll just show it to you here. Um, there's not a lot to get, but that's part of the point. Right? If you want to quickly introduce a practitioner to a human factors model that will help them out, um, this is much better than anything we've created in the past, we think. Um, there's the work systems, the work processes, the work outcomes, one feeds into the other, there's a feedback loop, and the components of the work system are the tools, the tasks, the people, the environment, and all of them are interconnected with the people in the middle. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through each of the tools um, for a couple of reasons. I want to just run through all seven of them so you can see them. Um, the first tool is called the PET scan. Um, PET stands for uh, People, Environments, Tools, and Tasks, which are the, the acronym for those components of the work system. And this is essentially a checklist to ensure the full breadth of the work system is considered in design, project planning, data collection analysis, reporting, priorities. I mean, anything you want to do that is connected to systems, you use this checklist to make sure that you've really understood the entire system. Um, the people map, uh, this, this is, I, I won't go into a lot of detail, um, but it, it kind of does what its name says, um, and that is, it represents the various people involved in the work system, 
how they relate to each other, how they interact. And when you create a, a people map of one group versus a people map of another group, you have two personas that you can compare. You can design for this persona and design for that persona, make sure you don't leave anybody out. And so the people map helps you represent the people in the system. Um, these two tools um, are the tasks and tools matrices, this one, and then the outcomes matrix. Um, and they're matrices, right? They're templates for uh, considering the, uh, the set of things that you need to account for uh, during design, as well as how they interact with each other. In this case, you need to design tasks, you need to design tools, you need to design the interaction between tasks and tools, uh, which we talked about before. This is a template to help you do that. Um, and then outcomes, obviously that's, that's the big payoff. So this helps you both uh, take stock of the outcomes that you are trying to measure, um, as well as you know, consider ways to measure those outcomes and, um, and, and the, the likelihood that they will occur against the template. Um, the fifth tool is the journey map. Um, I think you've probably heard about journey maps here and there. Um, they are a very powerful uh, large scale tool because they can be used in many different ways, very flexibly. Um, and uh, I won't go into the example, but this is uh, one example. And you can see what's really neat about a journey map is it leverages color, imagery, spatial relations, other techniques in order to convey multidimensional information in a very salient, usable, and memorable way. Now, the work that goes into creating the journey map is very, very strenuous, but the journey map itself serves as a really amazing artifact. Now, this one is the most confusing of all the tools, so I won't spend a lot of time on it, except to say that it's called the interaction diagram. And it helps you think about the ways that the multiple factors all work together to, to shape performance. It also helps you kind of reduce the complexity by choosing only the relevant and interacting causal factors rather than looking at all the factors. So it's not a checklist. It's more like a, a reduction technique. Um, finally, the system story is a way to tell a story, which is a very powerful a way to persuade people, inform people. Um, and I won't go through the example, but um, you know, I, I, I took the liberty of creating a um, system story around uh, either taking a militaristic mindset in response to the COVID-19 crisis early on in the pandemic versus taking an agile mindset, which we published in Modern Healthcare. Okay, I'm, I'm, I really wanna make sure to save time for questions. So what I'm going to do now is just give you a bit of a, a cheap plug and a preview of some other work that we've been doing now for uh, over a decade. Um, and, and it's to redefine human factors as a tool or a discipline that designs for healthcare professionals, um, you know, nurses, pharmacists, physicians, um, and the work that they do. Um, and also starts to include what can human factors do to support other people, um, patients, family members, uh, the public, you know, people who are not yet patients, who are still doing health-related work. Um, so again, this is a, a practical human factors, tools and methods for all issue. Um, and um, I wanna introduce this field um, by, by talking a little bit about some of the imagery that, that's on the left side here. Um, so this is uh, probably the uh, one of the uh, better um, edited handbooks written on human factors in healthcare for safety and quality. Um, it's called Around the Patient Bed, and it has this very nice painting, this um, artwork. Um, the cover art is actually um, a, a painting by Jan Steen um, called The Doctor's Visit, um, who is a uh, 18th century uh, realist Dutch painter. And, um, and, and now I want to uh, Point your attention to this quote by Anselm Strauss, a, a sociologist, who once said, the classic picture of the patient, whether painted by a discerning Dutch realist, uh, this guy, uh, or more recently described by Parsons, is of an acutely sick person, hence temporarily passive and acquiescent, being treated by an active physician, uh, helped by equally, equally vigorous caretakers. So here's the physician, here's the caretaker. This is a specimen jar with urine. Um, here's the passive, you know, uh, woe-ridden patient. And, and so uh, Strauss's claim is that, um, as a matter of fact, the, the focus has been on, on these folks here, the healthcare professionals and the work they do, but not on the work done by these individuals who are often depicted as passive and not active. And so Strauss wrote, 
there is such a thing as patient work and patient work is the exertion of effort and investment of time on the part of patients or family members to produce or accomplish something and really you know began a, a big movement in the social sciences to think about what the patients do now what we did is we took that movement and we uh, applied to it human factors and ergonomics remember human factors and ergonomics is about performance and fit and design and so we basically created this uh, discipline called the patient ergonomics discipline uh, or the science and engineering of patient work um, and uh, we, we say that it is the application of human factors or related disciplines to study or improve patients and other non-professionals' performance of effortful work activities in the pursuit of health goals. And so we use this other Jan Steen painting to, to kind of depict maybe these are the depictions of health that, to which patient ergonomics can be applied. Um, the the mealtime, uh, physical activity, social relations, um, but as well as medical activities like self-care, informal caregiving, the use of consumer health IT, patient clinician communication, and, and patient engagement and patient safety. So um, our whole thing is basically to take these methods from human factors and apply them to these novel settings with these novel workers in these uh, novel contexts. Um, my, my plug, and this is where I'll stop talking um, is is that we actually have uh, assembled um, the world's experts on patient ergonomics um, and so a colleague and i uh, put together the first ever handbook on the topic um, that was published um, in march of 2021 so very recently um, if you want to find it you can search the patient factor on amazon.com um, or on, on rutledge or crc press um, I recommend it um, for those who are interested in learning more about how do we apply human factors or human-centered design to improve the work that patients and families do. Um, and, and of course, I also invite you to either visit this link with more information on patient ergonomics um, or to read a couple of our most recent publications on the topic. Uh, with that, I'll, I'll, I'll stop. I'll look at the chat um, and I'll put up this reminder of what it is I really wanted you to learn, if nothing at all. Okay, so this is where. Thank you, Rich. I'm trying to pull up the chat. Okay, well, I, I see I see a question already, Nicole. Yeah. Um, and it's from Titus. He asks, um, let me turn off my screen share. How does SEEPS relate uh, to Byron Holtzblatt's models? So uh, that's a great question. So, yes, um, almost the same, right? So Byron Holtzblatt are the, um, the authors and the creators of what's called contextual design. Um, contextual design is a way to do human-centered design using um, observation, so seeing how people work in their natural settings, um, followed by um, you know, designing things to actually try in that natural setting and then observe again. Um, and the way that they try to depict what they learn um, from that contextual inquiry or that observation with interviewing is uh, what's called models. So they create a number of uh, models that can be um, uh, used to depict the, the kind of the social or the cultural um, uh, environment that was observed to understand the tools and artifacts that are currently being used before introducing a new one, to understand the processes and procedures that people use. Um, and so it's exactly the same goal, uh, slightly different tools and slightly different depictions of that work system and the work people do. Um, but I would say if somebody came to me and said, should I use the SEEPS tools or should I use uh, Byron Holtzblatt's models? I would say, you, you pick. I will help you use either one. Um, and often when I work with a project team that's trying to understand uh, the work system and then trying to design to improve the work system, um, I will actually propose those models as, as the ones that they should use to do so. Very similar. But, but not used by everyone. And, and that's kind of what we're trying to overcome. We're trying to create a little bit of a, uh, of a, a toolkit that we want to specifically tailor towards practitioners in healthcare, um, which contextual design is obviously uh, for everybody. But we wanted to create tools that could be demonstrated with healthcare examples, um, and of course, provide um, that toolkit directly to practitioners.
So, um, hi, this is Suranga. I have a question, if I may. Go ahead, Suranga, go ahead. So, Rich, this is really great. Really enjoyed it. I have a somewhat naive question in terms of definition. I liked your slide um, with the Shakespeare quote where you basically presented, you know, several broad definitions around um, human factors design. Um, where does the word cognitive sciences and the role of decision making fit in this? Is it part of HFE? Is it outside? Yeah, that's a great question, Saranga. So one way to answer it would, would be a very flippant, like who cares, right? I mean, if, if you want to go into the cognitive sciences toolkit and that's what helps you to design a better product that fits the human, that's amazing. I'm, I'm so glad you did that and I'll help you do that. Um, even if the two were unrelated, now, the other answer is the two are actually quite closely related. Some of it is historical. Um, there are a group of people in the uh, 1980s and 1990s who said, um, uh, we, we need a different field that's not as focused on errors and um, you know, error taxonomy and error reporting. And we need to create a field called cognitive systems engineering. Um, mm -hmm. And so it was basically you know, leveraging more of the cognitive sciences and the decision sciences to basically do the same thing as human factors people did, but to kind of move away from, you know, from, from a tradition and a, and a group that they didn't want uh, to be associated with as much. Mm -hmm. um, actually, the same thing happened with the field of human computer interaction. In the 1980s, they said, we really want to focus on software. And these ergonomics people are focused too much on the physical body and the, you know, the lifting and the you know, keyboards. We want to focus on software. So they went and they created a field called human centered uh, or a human computer interaction, HCI. Um, so these are all historical things that have happened, um, mm -hmm. but in fact, they're very related. They use the same theories. Um, they, they're usually people who attend all the conferences. Um, and so I would say, uh, you know, share and share alike. These mm -hmm. things are all um, uh, very complementary. That, that's the theme to all my answers, as you can tell, right? You know, how's this different from contextual inquiry? contextual design, it's not. How's this different from cognitive science? It's not. And one of the things that I'll point out too is that as a scientific discipline, human factors and ergonomics uh, looks to the basic cognitive and engineering sciences to figure out what's the right way to do things, right? So as we think about, for example, what's the size font of, this, of the app uh, that is going to be used by a person who's 70 years old versus 80 years old with corrective vision? we go to the cognitive sciences in order to determine what the answer should be. Sure, sure. So thank you, that really helps. Um, if I can add on that really quickly. So we use the term socio-technical systems, right? Humans and computers working together. When I read those definitions, I kind of miss seeing the human factors, evaluation and design you know, understanding that humans make decisions differently within a socio-technical system. So I keep thinking, you know, we have socio-technical systems, but there needs to be some kind of cognitive or decision-making component outside of that. Does it make sense to talk of it as a cognitive socio-technical system or a human factors socio-technical system? Yeah, I think there's there's actually language that I like to use from um, you know the health services world and the kind of, uh, biomedical world, and that's you know biopsychosocial, right? Ooh. And and it's a, it's across the the board, right? There are multiple levels. One thing I'd point out is if you think of it as like uh, the nesting dolls, right? Of like like the, the Russian nesting doll with one mm -hmm. doll inside of another doll inside of another doll. Um, I mean, they're, they're just different levels of analysis. And so cognitive performance happens in the context of a socio-technical system. Now, some people try to, you know, really just focus on that one small nesting doll, but what they don't pay attention to is, is that there is a context. So if you studied cognitive decisions in the laboratory, where you asked, you know, an undergraduate psychology uh, student to um, make a decision of, you know, do you want to um, pay one dollar for a healthy snack, or do you want to pay, you know, uh, uh, eighty-five cents for an unhealthy snack? You know, the results that you get will tell you something about human cognition, 
but they mm -hmm. won't tell you about human cognition in, in, in a realistic environment where there's other pressures, you know, that where's the family member saying, you know, spend less money, right? Where's the, <laughs> where's the, where's the family member saying eat healthy, right? Um, where's the, the pressure to like make a quick decision? Where's the hunger, right? So if you remove some of those components of the broader macro system or the socio-technical system, all of a sudden the cognition is, is really clinical laboratory based and therefore unrealistic. So I think mm -hmm. considering one without the other is, is, a, is a trap, um, but of course it goes the other way, right? So if you think about high level design of socio-technical systems and organizations, not understanding employee cognition is, is, a, is, a, is a problem. And so as you design at a high level, you need to think of the levels within and as you design at a low level, you need to think of the levels without. Thank you, that was very helpful. Any so other questions double, for while, while we're doing that and thinking about those questions, I'm gonna double down by putting my email into the chat in case people didn't get it on the other slides that it was on. Um, I, I really do sincerely mean that I am willing to entertain any requests um, or any offer of collaboration. Thank you, Rich. Thanks all, thanks Nicole.